Shalom Israel, it's Kazawan, and the name of this video is The Trinity Doctrine is False. I'm doing this video because even though most of us that know that we are the Israelites of the Bible, we don't believe in the Trinity, but a lot of us have family members and people around us that are hardcore Christians and they do believe in the Trinity. So we have to know how to deal with it when it's presented to us. A lot of us tell our family members that are not in the truth that what they believe is wrong. But sometimes we don't know how to properly show them that it's wrong. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 21 says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So that's what I want to do in this video through the Spirit of the Most High, Yahweh, in the name of His Son, Yahweh Now before I get into the scriptures, I have to give the proper understanding of what the Trinity Doctrine is because most people don't actually know what the Trinity Doctrine says, including Christians themselves. Many Christians disagree with the explanation of the Trinity given by other Christians. So let's properly define it according to the doctrine. Now, for all my hardcore Israelites out there, <laughs> I'm going to be using the term God a lot in this video because it's necessary for the point of this video. All right. Now, what is the official explanation of the Trinity? Here it is. The Trinity states that, number one, there is one and only one God. Number two, God eternally exists in three distinct divine persons. Number three, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Number four, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Holy Spirit. Now, here's a diagram that gives you a visual of what this list is saying. If we start here on the top left, we see that the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. So these are three distinct persons. However, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Therefore, according to the Trinity, God exists as three distinct divine persons who are identical in essence and co-eternal and co-equal in power. Again, the Trinity states, God exists as three distinct divine persons who are identical in essence and co-eternal and co-equal in power. So that is the official explanation of the Trinity. Now, let's go into the scriptures and deal with this from a biblical standpoint, because again, a lot of our people are caught up in this belief. Let's start with the verse that Trinitarians love to use. 1 Timothy 3 and 16, it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, the funny thing about this verse is that this verse is often used by the oneness movement, which is a whole different doctrine. The oneness doctrine states that Yahawashai operated as the father in the Old Testament, and then he came into the world to operate as the son, and then he took on the role of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Yahawashai would be the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit at different times throughout history. Now, this is not the same as the Trinity. The biggest difference is that in the oneness doctrine, which is also called modalism, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit never exist at the same time. But in the Trinity doctrine, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always coexisted together 
at the same time. Now, both of these doctrines are wrong, but today we're going to focus on the Trinity doctrine. Now, let's read 1 Timothy 3 and 16 again. It says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Many Trinitarians believe that this verse supports the Trinity because it says God was manifest in the flesh. The truth is the word God is not in the original text. The original text says he who was manifest in the flesh. The he is a reference to Yahweh Shai, not the Most High. Now, I'm not going to harp on this point because there's a lot of information to cover, but you can verify that for yourself by just looking it up. This is not hard to find. The Bible itself clearly explains that it was Yahweh Shai that came in the flesh, not the Most High. Let's go to 2 John 1 and 7. Here it is. It says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Yahweh Shai is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. See, Yahweh Shai was manifest or came in the flesh, not the Most High Yahweh. To say that the Most High came in the flesh is completely wrong and contrary to the Bible. The Most High sent Yahweh Shai. And he came in the flesh. Let's go to Hebrews 10 and 5. It says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, the he is Yahweh Shai, when he came into the world, it says, He saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. So the Most High prepared a body for Yahweh Shai to use. The Most High didn't get inside a body and come down here. He sent his son as a representative to show us how to be righteous. Now, the argument is not rather or not Yahweh Shai is a God, because the Bible clearly teaches that he is a God, but it does not teach that he is the Most High God, nor does it teach that he is co-equal in authority with the Most High. See, that's one of the gross errors of the Trinity doctrine. Let's go to Hebrews 1 and 8. Now, this is the Most High talking to Yahweh Shai. It says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, have anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So we see that Yahweh Shai is called God by the Most High himself. So we can't debate the fact that Yahweh Shai is a God. However, he is not equal to the Most High God, Yahweh. Now, we have to explain this because a lot of Old Testament only Israelites have a problem with Yahweh Shai being called a God. So how can we reconcile Yahweh Shai being called a God in the New Testament when the Most High Yahweh said in the Old Testament that he is the only God? We reconcile this issue by putting verses in their proper context. Let's go to Isaiah 44 and 6. It says, Thus saith Yahweh, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Yahweh of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So here we see that the Most High clearly states that there is no other God except Him. Now we have to establish the context of this statement. The context here is talking about the Most High being the Almighty God who is above all. How do we know that? Let's go to Psalms 82 and 6. Now, this is the Most High speaking. It says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. So here we see the Most High saying 
that we, the children of Israel, are gods. It's the same exact Hebrew word. Why would the Most High say that we are gods in this verse when he said that he was the only God in Isaiah 44 and 6? The reason is because in Isaiah 44 and 6, he was referring to his position of authority being the almighty God who is above everyone and equal to no one else. There is no God like the Most High. See, the Trinity states that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct divine persons who are co-equal in power. That's a false doctrine. When the Most High called Yahweh Shai God in Hebrews 1 verses 8 and 9, he wasn't making Yahweh Shai equal to himself, just like he wasn't making us equal to himself when he called us gods in Psalms 82 and 6. So the Most High addressing Yahweh Shai as God is not a violation of anything found in the Torah or the Tanakh. Yahweh Shai knows that he is not on the same level with the Most High. He taught that himself repeatedly. Look at this. John 14 and 28. This is Yahweh Shai talking. It says, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father. Look at this. For my Father is greater than I. That's plain as can be. Yahweh Shai said openly that his Father was greater than he was. He never tried to exalt himself above the Most High. Now, people do it all the time because of their lack of understanding. But Yahweh Shai stayed in order. So any arguments about his position from Old Testament only brothers should be against people who misrepresent what Yahweh Shai taught, not against Yahweh Shai. He knew his position and he acknowledged it openly. Now, let's get back to the Trinity and deal with another passage that Trinitarians use. This is Matthew 3 and 16. It says, And Yahweh Shai, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So here we have Yahweh Shai in the water. That's one. The Spirit of the Most High descending like a dove, that's two. And a voice from heaven speaking, that's three. Trinitarians claim that this passage shows God operating as three distinct persons. Now, when we look at this passage, what we see is Yahawashai, the Son, being baptized in the water. The Spirit of the Most High that came down like a dove was not a person. It was the anointing or the power of the Most High. The anointing power of the Father came down upon the Son. Why? Watch this. Acts 10 and 38. It says, How God anointed Yahweh Shai of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. See, the Holy Spirit that came down on Yahweh Shai was the anointing power of the Most High because he was starting his ministry. The Spirit that came down upon Yahweh Shai was not a person. It was the power of the Most High. Now, what about the voice that they heard? The voice that they heard at the baptism was an angel speaking as a messenger for the Most High. Let's prove it. This is John 5 and 37. It says, And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Watch this. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Now, Yahweh said this after he was baptized which proves that the voice that they heard was not really the Most High's voice. 
It was an angel speaking on his behalf, just like they always did throughout the Bible. Yahweh Shai said, ye have neither heard his voice at any time. Another argument that Trinitarians use is the question of who raised Yahweh Shai from the dead. They believe that the Bible teaches that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit did it, therefore proving that God consists of three distinct persons. Now, how did they come up with that? Let's see. We're going to start with Yahweh Shai first. This is John chapter 10, verse 17. It says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So here we see that Yahawashai said that he laid down his own life and that he took it up again. Now, let's look at the Holy Spirit. This is Romans 8 and 11. It says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Yahawashai from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up the Messiah from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So they say that this verse shows that the Holy Spirit rose Yahawashai from the dead. Now, let's look at the Most High. This is Galatians 1 and 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of men, neither by man, but by Yahawashai, watch this, and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now here it says that God the Father rose Yahawashai from the dead. So these are three verses that Trinitarians use to support their doctrine. Now, I'm going to deal with this in one second, but it's amazing that Trinitarians read this verse and miss the fact that Paul defines the Father alone as God. Look at these verses on the screen. Every other time that Paul uses the phrase God the Father, he always identifies the Son as the Lord Yahweh Shai. Paul never once wrote God the Father and God the Son. You know why? Because Yahweh Shai didn't refer to himself that way. Yahweh Shai said he was the Son of God. He never said he was God the Son. There's a big difference between those two statements. The Son of God is one thing, but God the Son denotes equality. Now, we already read in John 14 and 28 where Yahweh Shai said his father was greater than him, which lines up with Isaiah 40 and 25, where the Most High said that nobody was equal to him. But the concept of three co-equal persons contradicts the Old Testament and Yahweh Shai's own statement. The Trinity doctrine is false and is flawed beyond compare. However, Let's go back and deal with the verses that we read to see who actually rose Yahweh Shai from the dead. The first one was John 10, verses 17 and 18. It says, Therefore does my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. So here we see that Yahweh Shai said that he had the power to lay his life down and the power to take it again. Now the question is, where did he get the power from? Let's see. It says, This commandment have I received of my Father. So the power to rise from the dead was given to Yahweh Shai by his Father. Therefore, it was the power of the Most High that rose Yahweh Shai from the dead. Now, let's go to Romans 8 and 11. It says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Yahweh Shai from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up the Messiah from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit 
that dwelleth in you. Now, when you look at this verse closely, it says the spirit of him that raised Jehovah Shai. It doesn't say the spirit did it. It says the spirit of him. Who is the him? The him is the most high Yahweh. It was the spirit of the most high, not a separate additional spirit. It was the most high spirit, which is the same spirit that came down upon Yahweh Shai at his baptism. In other words, it was the power of the most high that rose Yahweh Shai from the dead. It was not a different person distinct from the most high. It was the power of the most high. See, probably the biggest flaw in the Trinity doctrine is the misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit. Trinitarians and others fail to understand that the Holy Spirit is the manifested power of the Most High, not a third person who is part of a single God. John tells us that the Most High is a spirit, and multiple verses tell us that he is holy. The Most High is the Holy Spirit. I didn't say a Holy Spirit. I said the Holy Spirit, meaning the top spirit and the holiest of them all. See, I have to clarify that because some people like to play games and say, well, angels are holy and they're spirits. That's true. But a holy angel is a Holy Spirit by definition. But the Most High Yahweh is the Holy Spirit of the Bible. And there is no one equal to him. Look at this. This is Ephesians 4 and 3. It says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse 6, one God. It says one God. And this is not talking about three persons that coexist as one God. How do we know that? We know that because verse 4 says one spirit. Verse 5 says one Lord. That's Yahweh Shai. And verse 6 says one God. But then it tells you who the one God is. It says and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, this is the second time that Paul described God as the father by himself. Therefore, it's false to say that God consists of three persons co-equal in power. Now, let's go to another passage that the Trinitarians love. This is John 14 and 26. It says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So this verse says that the father will send the Holy Spirit to his people. Now, Trinitarians think that this proves that the Holy Spirit is a different person distinct from the Most High because it says the Father will send him. Well, let's go up to verse 15. Let's see who or what the Holy Spirit is. This is John chapter 14, verse 15. This is Yahweh Shai speaking. It says, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, most people read this and don't realize what Yahweh Shai is saying. Yahweh Shai said that the spirit of truth, 
was dwelling with them at that time and that it would be in them later. Here's the question. Who was dwelling with them at that time? He was. He was physically with them at that time. But he also said that the spirit would be in them later. Watch what he says next. Verse 18. It says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yahweh is clearly saying that he is the spirit of truth. Notice in verse 16, the spirit of truth is called the comforter. Verse 17 says, the comforter will come and dwell in us. In verse 18, Yahweh said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you, meaning I will come and comfort you. Now, remember, the scripture said the father was going to send the Holy Spirit. Watch this. This is Galatians 4 and 6. And this is after Yahweh Shai died and rose. It says, and because ye are sons, God have sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we clearly see that the spirit that the Most High sent was the spirit of his son. Why? Because Yahweh Shai had the Holy Spirit. The power of the Most High worked through him. And the Most High sends that same spirit to us when we follow and keep his commandments. See, the power of the Most High or the Holy Spirit manifests itself in many different ways. Look at this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. It says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. What Spirit is this? The Holy Spirit. See, there are many different gifts, but the source of all of them is the same Spirit. Let's jump down to verse 8. It says, For to one is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, to another, faith, by the same Spirit, to another, the gifts of healing, by the same Spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Watch this, verse 11. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So we clearly see that the same spirit gives us different gifts. But James 1 and 17 tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Now, we know that the Father is a spirit. Therefore, he is the spirit that gives us different gifts. We just read in 1 Corinthians 12 and 11 that there is one self-same spirit, not two. All gifts come from the same spirit, not two different spirits. Again, the Trinity is a false doctrine. Let's go to another passage that the Trinitarians use. This is Acts chapter 5, verse 1. It says, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and bought a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why have Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So Trinitarians point out that Peter said that they lied to the Holy Ghost. Now, let's keep reading. Verse 4. It says, Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So in verse 3, Peter said they lied to the Holy Spirit. But in verse 4, Peter said they lied to God. 
Therefore, Trinitarians say that this proves that the Holy Spirit is God. Now, this passage is not saying that the Holy Spirit is a separate person who was also God. The Most High, who is holy and a spirit, is the Holy Spirit. When Ananias and Sapphira lied to Peter, they automatically lied to the Most High because Peter was operating in the spirit of the Most High. That's all this verse is saying. It's not teaching a separate person who is the same as God. It's not saying that. All right. Now, I saved the two most popular passages for last. Matthew 28 and 19 and 1 John 5 verses 7 and 8. These are the Trinitarian go-to verses. What I'm about to go over can potentially discourage some of you if you're not strong in the truth. Let me say this. The Bible is emphatically the word of the Most High. But we have to study ourselves approved unto the Most High to make sure everything lines up. This is why we go precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now, with that said, let's go to Matthew 28 and 19. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, this verse is often used to validate the Trinity doctrine. However, when you do the research on this verse, you find out that it's not that simple. A lot of people don't know what I'm about to show you. First of all, we don't have the original manuscripts of Matthew today, but we do have writings from men who saw the original manuscripts and they quoted from them. For example, St. Jerome, who is most known as the translator of the Latin Vulgate, he made a very interesting statement in the Catalog of Ecclesiastical Writers. This is what he said, and I quote, Matthew, who was also Levi, composed a gospel in the Hebrew language and characters. Furthermore, watch this, the Hebrew itself is preserved to this day in the library at Caesarea which the martyr Pamphilus so diligently collected. So we see that Jerome had access to the Hebrew manuscripts of Matthew, which was stored in the library at Caesarea. Now, before Jerome had them, they were under the care of Eusebius. Eusebius wrote many different writings, and in those writings, he quoted the Hebrew form of Matthew 28 and 19 more than 18 times. Every time he quoted it from the Hebrew Matthew manuscripts, this is what it said. And I quote, Go ye and make disciples of all the nations in my name, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. Now, notice what's missing. The words in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost are not there. Why? Because those words were added later on in order to push the Trinity doctrine. Now with the names I said, I've given you enough information that you can do the research for yourself so that you can check to see that this is the truth. All you have to do is research the authenticity of Matthew 28 and 19 and you will get tons of information. Again, the authenticity of Matthew 28 and 19 or anything of that nature and you will get tons of information. Now, here's something to think about. If Shai told the disciples to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, why is it that they never did that? Every time we see a baptism is always done in the name of Shai. Look at this. There is not one example in the Bible of anybody baptizing anyone 
in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not one. Baptism was only done in the name of Yahweh Shai. That is biblical proof that the current Matthew 28 and 19 is not authentic. If it is, then all the disciples disobeyed Yahweh Shai, and we know that that's not the case. Another passage in the Bible used to support the Trinity doctrine is 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. However, once again, research of this passage reveals a truth that a lot of us don't know about. Biblical scholars openly admit that the modern version of 1 John 5, verses 7 and 8 is not found in the older manuscripts. Let's take a look at 1 John 5 and 7. It says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now in verse 7, we see the phrase, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now this verse definitely seems to support the Trinity doctrine. However, this is not the original reading of this verse. The older manuscripts do not include the words, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Look at this. This is 1 John 5 and 7 from the Blue Letter Bible. If you click on the New King James Version of the Bible, which I am not promoting, I'm just making a point. If you click on this version and you scroll to the bottom of the page, you will see a footnote. Now, when you look at verse 8, it says, In you text and M text omit the words from in heaven, verse 7, through on earth, verse 8. What does that mean? The NU text stands for the Nestle-Alain Greek New Testament. That's the N. And the United Bible Society, that's the U. These New Testament manuscripts are older than what we read today. You can find these published in the 26th edition of the Nestle-Alain Greek New Testament and in the United Bible Society's 3rd edition. Scholars openly admit that these older manuscripts do not contain the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in that passage. Let me read the rest. It says, Only four or five very late manuscripts contain these words in Greek. So, the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are very late additions interjected into the text to support the Trinity doctrine. So let's see how the verse was written in the early manuscripts. 1 John 5 and 7. For there are three that bear record. That's it. That's the full verse 7 in the original manuscripts. Verse 8 says, The Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Everything between these two verses that we read today did not exist in the original text. This is proof that the modern version of 1 John 5 verses 7 and 8 is not authentic. It was added to support the doctrine of the Trinity. Once again, the original reading is, For there are three that bear record, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. So, these verses say nothing at all about the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Once again, if you want to study this and verify it for yourself, here's what you do. Research the term, comma, Johannayim. That's comma, Johannayim. When you look into this, what you're going to find is that in 1522, Desiderius Erasmus added the words, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost to his translation after receiving political pressure to add it to the text. There are no manuscripts before the 16th century that include the words 
the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Let me say it again. There are no manuscripts before the 16th century that include the words, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. This information is well known by many biblical historians. Now, look at this. This is a footnote in one of the Bibles in my house. When you look at verses 7 and 8, it says, Late manuscripts of the Vulgate. Now it's going to tell you what it says in there. It says, Testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Verse 8, And there are three that testify on earth. The. Now look, it says, not found in any Greek manuscripts before the 16th century. This is in one of my Bibles. So again, 1 John 5, 7, and 8 cannot be used to prove the Trinity in the Bible because it was not in the original manuscripts. Now, before I end this video, this should not deter you from the faith of the Bible. I want to be very clear about this. It just means that we have to study to show ourselves approved so that we're not deceived, okay? The doctrine that we teach has to line up across the board. You can't have two random verses that just pop out of nowhere that don't precept with anything else properly. So do the research on Matthew 28 and 19, 1 John 5, 7 and 8. I've given you enough information to look into it for yourself and verify that it was added to the text to push the Trinity doctrine. So that's pretty much it. I could go further, but the point is made. All praises to the Most High, Yahweh, in the name of His Son, Yahweh Shai. I hope you got some understanding, Israel. And with that, I say, Shalom.